history. This afternoon, we're going to hear stories about a broken wax record, about a pair of wax records, and some hot wax that was uh, recorded here in Los Angeles. Um, there's a lot of information to cover this afternoon and a lot of good music to hear. And so um, I want to get started right on time here. At the end of the table on your right is Charlie Hummel. Most of you know him. He's a well-known dealer, longtime collector of antique phonographs and Edisonia. Uh, a couple years ago I was visiting Charlie and uh, he mentioned, a, he motioned to something on the floor over there by his desk. <laughs> It's one of those cans over there. And he said, He's, open it up, open it up, take a look inside. And I, and I unscrewed the top and out wafted this fragrance, you know, the sweet smell of Columbia wax, brown wax, you know, which is like catnip to a record collector. <laughs> but um, I have to say my reverie was dashed as soon as I looked in the can and I saw the contents, this beautiful wax record was in pieces, just jumbled totally at the bottom. But I said, get this to Conchalian. <laughs> Charlie had already, ta already thought about that. He was way ahead of me. I think you all know Mike Conchalian here in the middle. He's the cylinder doctor. He's pioneered methods of reconstructing broken wax records. Using his skills, he practices daily as a dentist. Mike shared his techniques with us, in fact, a few years ago at our annual conference. Today I'm hoping that uh, they have some good news and some good sounds to share with us. So please welcome my good friends Mike Conchalian and Charlie Hummel. Speaking of wax, it was very nice, David, to have you wax on about all that. That was good. Ah, but a boom That wasn't worth a butta-boom. <clears throat> Well, I hope you're having a good weekend. All I can tell you is I really look forward to these. As you can see on our fancy screen there, uh, the Multiplex Grand. What in the world could that be? <clears throat> well, to give you a little background, <clears throat> and <laughs> McDonald also invented and patented a much improved pantograph, as well as the Bijou, otherwise known as the Model N Bijou, and its uh, cousins, the AS and the N coin ops. Also, the Eagle Model B with its, his classic two-spring motor and the Model Q, the uh, wonderful Columbia toy phonograph, and the concept of the grand cylinder concept. I think I said that wrong. <laughs> his patent featured scientific formulas demonstrating why a minimum surface speed of 44 meters a minute were required for accurate sound recording with original volume and ideal frequency response. If one wished to continue with the standard 120 RPM of the time, that's a cool concert record, this would require an external diameter of some four and three quarter inches. Therefore, the grander concert cylinder was born and patented. McDonald invented next the GG machine, the first Columbia Grand machine to accommodate these new large cylinders, and also his famous AB graphophone to play both the large and the standard cylinders. Among his 50 plus patents were also improvements in gold molding, the lyric reproducer, a combined reproducer and recorder as was used in dictaphones up into the 1940s and 50s, and it was he, in fact, and not Marconi, who also invented the Marconi flexible records. Now, all of this just to give you an a little bit idea of who this man is. Nevertheless, the subject of today's presentation is what a number of we phonograph and record enthusiasts, <laughs> enthusiasts truly consider the holy grail of this hobby, and that is McDonald's legendary multiplex graphophone grand. The stuff dreams are made of, the mythical beast reproducing inadvertent stereo on a behemoth of a wax cylinder, <clears throat> therefore not, not known, pardon me, for waxing on like that. <clears throat> and uh, now not known to be extant for some hundred years. Now take a look at this crazy patent, if you can. Uh, incredibly ahead of its time. Some of the key concepts of this patent may be a little different than what you envisioned. Stereo wasn't quite the idea, although it was theoretically possible with this machine. In this particular patent, four reproducers or recorders are specified each with slightly greater thickness and diameter than the next. In a quadruple carriage, facilitating synchronized recording and reproduction of the multiple soundtracks, in this case four. 
In making records with this instrument, the performers would be so grouped and the sound horns so arranged that the great volume of the sound of high pitch would converge upon that most sensitive and smaller diaphragm, while those of a lower, more bass pitch upon a less sensitive, thicker diaphragm, and so forth. McDonald continued to experiment with this concept from 1898 through 1900, designing various models and prototypes with varying numbers of recorders or reproducers, <clears throat> various size cylinders. McDonald and the board chose to make a three reproducer multiplex. Ah, uh, the photo. I love that photo. <clears throat> As the, here it is, the pièce de résistance for the Columbia Phonograph Company exhibits at the Paris Exposition beginning in April of 1900. We now know, now I hadn't known this, that the Red Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Abdul Hamid II, wanted this apparatus. This Paris Expo multiplex machine was promised to the Sultan at the close of the exposition. Now in that infamous trade magazine, the phonoscope, collect the whole set, <clears throat> of March 1900, it was proclaimed of this multiplex machine about to be revealed in Paris that the principles of the grand type graphophone are followed in its construction with the addition of several peculiarly novel features. One of these is the increased size of the cylinder. In diameter, the multiplex blank will be created two inches wider than its grand prototype and <clears throat> will be three times as long. This is what it said. Secondly is the use of two, three, or more reproducers or recorders, three being used in the present example. Finally, the article goes on to describe three different reproducers, of course, with diaphragms of increasing thickness and diameter. Well, Michael, with this as background, off to Paris. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> it's Sunday, <clears throat> and I can hear myself. It's Sunday, July 29th, 1900. The Paris Exposition has just begun a few months earlier and would continue until November 12th of that year. Muzaffar Adi Shah Hajar, it took me a while to get that. Uh, let me try that again. Uh, Muzaffar Adin Shah Khajar has just arrived with his entourage from Tehran, having traveled leisurely through Europe beginning April 13th. <clears throat> and here's our man right here. This fellow became Shah in 1897 after a rather loose and free life uh, after his father's assassination because his father had reigned some 50 years. I don't think he anticipated it ever being uh, the ruler. Uh, his father, by the way, had been to Europe in 1873, 78, and lastly in 1889, at which time he actually visited with European phonograph schmoozer extraordinaire, Colonel George Gouraud. On July 8, 1889, at Lord Brownlow's mansion, Gouraud displayed Edison's new phonograph to the Shah and promised to send him one in Tehran. Now his son, Mozaffar, was also very fond <clears throat> of these emerging Western technologies. Now the first evening at the Expo, he witnessed a Lumiere cinematography program at the Festival Hall, viewing scenes of the exposition, including the famous moving sidewalk and ships crossing the Seine River. This sidewalk's interesting. It has two levels, a lower level, which goes a little slower, and a higher level, which goes quite a bit faster. You must board the lower one before you dare board the upper one. Um, also, films were shown, it says, of Africans and Arabs traveling on camels, which he found very interesting. He instructed his personal photographer to, quote, buy every kind of cinema cinematographic equipment and ended up with a complete Demony cinematography system as well as a Gamont stereo camera, top of the line stopwatch, etc., etc. The Shah is indeed called the father of the Iranian cinema to this day. <laughs> And here's our man in some of this very early cinema here. <clears throat> love that, love that music. You can't miss that mustache, that's your man. <clears throat> there we are, and now let's all go see the Lumiere program. 
On August 2nd, the Shah entered the Pathé Phonograph exhibit, but was blocked on his left and right by a very large crowd. He advanced and, according to accounts, seemed to be blessing the little children in the forefront. In actuality, he wanted them out of the way. He approached a Pathé Phonograph with great curiosity, which was playing the Persian National Anthem. He enjoyed these machines as long as he could, finally congratulating one of the Pathé brothers before moving on to motor vehicles, cycles, and tricycles. Here you see the French coverage uh, in the press. Also on August 2nd, the Shah enjoyed a lengthy photo cinema theater event. A very early sound and film system. With this system, the scenes were first filmed, and then the performers recorded their dialogue or songs on Henri Lire's Lioretograph, trying to match tempo with the projected filmed performance. The Lire EDL wax cylinder used for the sound accompaniment was an amazing 7.8 inches in length and 5.9 in diameter. When presenting the Phono Cinema Theater productions, synchronization of sorts was achieved by adjusting the hand cranked film projector's speed to match the phonograph, as you see here in this original extant example. <laughs> It was not yet time for sound film. <laughs> on, <laughs> on August 5th, after breakfast, the Shah met with Gratiolet Clement Maurice, the early cinematographer who had developed this phono cinema theater. The Shah was asked to act and speak for the camera, and then he spoke into the Lioretic. Li no, 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 try that again. The Lioretograph, matching his words with his filmed movements. After lunch, the Shah hurriedly returned to the Palace of the Sovereigns, where he was staying adjacent to the expo. I don't think he was wearing that hat, but anyway. Um, because his foreign minister had heard the Columbia Multiplex Grand at the Columbia exhibit and arranged for Thomas McDonald or possibly another Columbia rep to come out to him personally with the marvelous apparatus. The Shah recorded his voice and became completely amazed after hearing all the multiplex could do. I am assured by my friend, Dr. Richard Dick Majin, the internationally recognized Middle East political scientist at my alma mater down the street there, uh, USC. I don't have the, the band music for it like Kurt did, but um, <laughs> after discovering that this well, you know, Aggies, yeah, right. Let's see, after discovering that this had been built especially for Abdul Hamid II, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, the Shah predictably had to have one. As my friend said, a little predictable competition there. As the multiplex would be dispatched to Constantinople by fair's end, the Shah, of course, immediately ordered a Columbia multiplex grand for himself, understanding that one would have to be specially built for him. And so it was, not being being completed until March 26th of 1901. The completed machine, along with recorders, reproducers, three 56-inch horns and crane, along with 34 barrels of recorded and blank cylinders, supposedly 150 in total, were shipped from American Graphophone in Bridgeport, arriving in Batum, that's in the Republic of Georgia on the Black Sea, it then traveled completely by camel caravan, the long journey to Tehran, Iran, arriving in June to July of 1900. Now, uh, here's a fine example of the American press covering this dramatic event with great precision. Uh, this is May 11th of 1901. And uh, <clears throat> this is what our article has to say. Uh, wanting to get the very best machine that ever was built, the Shah selected, of course, this marvelous instrument. If there is not a revolution in Persia in a short time, it will not be the fault of the American composers of <coughs> uh, coon songs. <coughs> Ragtime music is to be sprung for the first time on the unsuspecting Shah and his cohorts. When the tin tenabulations of the syncopated melodies once get into the brains and the feet of the Shah's suite, they will gradually percolate from the royal palaces out through the gardens and grounds, and so to the subjects. 
As is well known, ragtime is like the scarlet fever. It spreads rapidly, nothing will stop its rages, and it often leaves traces of its visit in its trail. No, it's not going to be a minstrel company, but this graphophone, and not any graphophone. In fact, this graphophone is the largest and most costly ever made. It cost the Shah, I think we have our facts wrong here, $5,000, and the 150 records, $1,500 more. The machine is known technically as a multiplex grand, <clears throat> and is as high and as wide as a railroad car. <laughs> okay, uh, and then it goes on with some politically incorrect uh, uh, supposing of what he will will say when the following words come out of the, uh, you know, let's not get into it. Um, now then, in 1904, an improved multiplex machine was featured at the St. Louis World's Fair, along with this impressive supporting cast of characters here. And uh, if you'll look here at this next little sheet, uh, are just a few of the marvelous examples of Columbia and largely McDonald ingenuity, which came out, and we'll talk about some of those a little later. Well, uh, this time, the multiplex sported three AW-style reproducers and employed a 14-inch cylinder. As of today, the one 1904 multiplex and the two 1900 examples, one first delivered to Istanbul, of course, and one to Tehran the following year, these have failed to turn up. But I do have my feelers out through my friend Dr. Dek Majin, starting with the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul or the Golestan Palace in Tehran, and uh, stay tuned. Over 20 years ago, the triple reproducer carriage of the 1904 multiplex machine did turn up, as many of you know, having been stored for years at the American Graphophone Archives in Bridgeport, Connecticut. This, we know, was made to accommodate the 14-inch length cylinder with three tracks, each commencing four and a half inches apart from the next. Or a singularly lengthy recording across the entire length of the cylinder could be purchased or, of course, created by the owner. As both 1900 multiplex machines are known to have left our shores over 100 years ago and no cylinders had ever been located, it really has seemed remote that anything pertaining to these machines or cylinders would ever show. But then, Charlie has something to share with you. Let there be light, and there was. No, I got the wrong thing. But anyhow, it started out about 110 years ago. We have gatherers. We're to go back to the caveman days. We have gatherers and hunters. And I believe I'm the hunter part of the gatherers. I find stuff, and I have to go to people like Kachelian and other people to find out what I found. So this started out in Bridgeport, Connecticut, about 110 years ago. Somehow, the archives that actually came from the, from the graphophone company these are the cylinder boxes, original cylinder boxes that they were in. This particular machine is, um, and we believe is the recording end of it, that we do the recording of these uh, records. And then you have the smallest machine in the world. If you look up there, it says uh, the smallest machine in the world for the Shaw. And also a shaver to shave the records down. In regards to uh, uh, when I found them, I opened this box up, the, the larger of the boxes, and there was a bunch of records in the bottom of it with some felt belting. I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, thank God I had enough sense not to throw it out. Most people need the space. Us collectors, we need the space in the room so we get rid of whatever we can't use. But we're talking 25 years ago. I picked this up in, in New York State and brought it home. And they sat in my storage spot for probably another till June of uh, last year. And I said, well, it's about time we start working on these cylinders and see what's in it. So I brought it out, I talked to Mike Kachelian, and I told him I was bringing out a container. First thing he does, like all you cylinder people out there, I 
I know they're closet collectors and you don't understand it, but what do you do to the brown wax when you first get it? You first look around, then you start to sniff it, and you wonder, <laughs> oh, I never knew you sniffed brown wax records, but uh, look on Mike's face after he opened up that thing, he was hooked. And I looked into his eyes, and it was like exity. So I think that was where they got the drugs from, your, your brown wax people sniffing records. That's where that drug started with this. We didn't know what to do with it, but uh, I knew Mike could, could work on it and get it back. It, it's a miracle that he did. But anyhow, uh, basically that's where it came from. And uh, from Mike took it over and started putting it together. I'm going to turn it back to Mike, and Mike is going to show you how we perform these miracles. <laughs> Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> In late June, I began the process in my dental office of laying out in an organized manner every piece of matter in that can. There were some 30 more sizable shards, the largest of which was seven inches by three, and over 100 smaller shards ranging all the way down to two by three millimeters, and finally a significant dusting of brown wax micro bits, shall we say. I had no way at the start to know exactly what the wax shards belonged to, and if they belonged to one original cylinder or to a number of cylinders. <clears throat> All pieces displayed a light tan color on the outside or grooved surface with light tan ribs with beige yellow inter rib areas, which uh, is typical of cylinders made right around 1900 by the Columbia Phonograph Company. It turned out that parts of exactly two cylinders were in that can. Very painstakingly, a majority of wax pieces could be juxtaposed and therefore verified as having once belonged to a single, huge, and very thick cylinder. While a few shards also had the thickness typical of a regular Columbia Grand Concert type cylinder. Using precision heated custom metal staples, I began assembling one piece to another, being sure to line the grooves up just so, and assuring that the vertical and lateral dimensions were precise and exact as the heat was applied and throughout the cooling process. These operations are all reversible and adjustable and must be to meet conservancy standards, assuring that any inaccuracy in initial juxtapo uh, juxtaposing or future dimensional changes can be accommodated and corrected. <laughs> By mid-August, the basic form of the large cylinder became apparent, although many huge defects and large canyons both inside and out, as well as huge interfaces between rejoined pieces remained to contend with. So now the goal is to begin to restore those deep crevices and canyons, some of which were over an inch wide and a half inch deep. Eroded crack interfaces abounded everywhere from one millimeter to a half inch across. A specially colored wax formula was applied millimeter by millimeter into each defect. Once fully filled, the external topography had to be exactly duplicated in contour and perfectly polished. This is the only hope for a stylus making it across the divide and finding its correct groove mate on the other side. After restoring the beginning inch and a half of the grooved surface of the massive wax cylinder, the day arrived in August when Charlie came out with the aluminum upper works. The goal, to safely coax some sound from the first inch and a half of the huge cylinder. As a small crowd of witnesses looked on, <clears throat> That's my boy there. As a small crowd of witnesses looked on, we connected the mandrel pulley of the aluminum upper works to the heavy duty spring motor of a Columbia BC machine. The cylinder fit perfectly on the mandrel, which blew us away. Obviously, this mandrel was made for it. Then, the feed screw of the giant mechanism could not be operated for the lack of a gear, and so yours truly uh, handheld the sure cartridge with a 7 mil sapphire to the 100 thread per inch cylinder surface to become the human feed screw. <laughs> 20 seconds of continuous modulation was digitally transcribed that evening. An initial presentation of the machine with its cylinder in the earliest stages of restoration took place at the California Antique Phonograph Society annual banquet in Buena Park in mid-August. Continuing on with the cylinder restoration involved restoring all remaining surfaces defects over a 10-month period. One of the most challenging parts uh, was this grooved heart-shaped shard which belonged, uh, always use the working end of your laser here, right there, 
Um, uh, this crazy heart-shaped shard belonged in the midst of a void with no surviving contacting grooved surfaces at all. Uh, lining the grooves up betwixt this shard and the remaining exterior circumference became one of the toughest challenges of this entire project. But you know, once you're done and you look at it, after all the work, it looks at you and says, I love you, babe. You know, I really like that. <laughs> The restoration of the groove surface of the cylinder was finally completed March 26, 2011. On this day, I joined dear friend, Oscar-winning Hollywood sound legend and friend Mark Yolano at my home with uh, Michael Sherman, celebrated author and numismatic authority right here, and uh, Peter Gazanian, a summa cum laude graduate in industrial engineering, working with, who else, Southern California Edison. The goal, to completely and safely extract all the sound from this behemoth, and to discover if this really was a true 1900 Columbia multiplex cylinder and a 1900 multiplex cylinder machine, for that matter. Oh, what were the dimensions of the cylinder, you ask? Well, you didn't, but you're going to hear. Uh, over nine and three quarter inches in length and six and a half inches in external diameter. We set things up again with the uh, pulley, as you see right there, and uh, got things spinning. And at this point, we had a feed screw gear created, and uh, I had to create this crazy uh, adaptation here. Uh, I went to the dental office and said, what do I have around here? And I found some of this uh, acrylic, mixed that up, and used, if you ever had a root canal, you know that silly little rubber thing as they put in your mouth. There's a little clamp that clamps that rubber dam to your tooth. It's a really fun experience. Uh, well, I decided to use it for something fun and used it to accommodate that little hanging support for a Columbia floating reproducer. And uh, so we connected all this stuff on and then we could uh, connect our sure cartridge to this whole affair. And uh, thus we were able, oh, also I used that little red wire that you can barely see because I had to lift that reproducer housing up so that it would not uh, bottom out on the cylinder. And if I've lost you, I'm sorry. But uh, at any rate, that's the only way to get this thing to go. To go. And we actually had this cylinder begin to reveal its secrets. The friction on this upper work system was much increased this time simply due to the fact that the feed nut was engaging now. <coughs> and I can't tell you all we had to do in order to get it to track right and to not lose speed. But alas, we were successful. That's a cylinder and my son's hair combined there. Uh, <coughs> the second endeavor was now to discover if what we had, as I said, was this true mythical Columbia multiplex cylinder from 1900. Three track? No. Single track variety? Yes. Now, the single track variety was advertised. You could either have three separate tracks or you could have a longer playing selection going across the whole thing. That's what this is. Didn't know it till that day. The color is a typical 1900 light tan wax with an orange interior. Now, in recent memory, the dimensions of these cylinders was always generally believed to have been 14 inches long with an external diameter of five inches. What did we have? Nine and three quarter inches in length and six and a half inches in width. Now, what was this thing? Now, you may recall that in the article in the March 1900 phonoscope, we said that di the diameter of the multiplex cylinder was two inches larger than a grand cylinder, which is about four and two thirds inches. That would work out to an external diameter from six and a half to six and three quarter inches. Okay, that's exactly borne out here. But recall that our article also states that the multiplex cylinder would be over three times the length of a grand cylinder. Now that's over 12 inches, or presumably up to 14 inch length, which we've come to accept, certainly at least for the 1904 uh, multiplex. Nevertheless, other period articles have said two and a half inches in standard length, which would be two and a half times... Here's the original photo of the 1900 multiplex machine. Uh, we see 3D reproducers here, and uh, one thing we did learn from doing some computations, and we'll jump right to that. <coughs> Let's go right to our computations. So. Yeah, here you see the 1900 machine and you see the 1904 machine here. 1900, 1904. This is the known carriage for the 1904 machine, four and a half inches between each stylus. Next. 
<clears throat> what we decided to do, and we used a lot of trigonometry here with, with uh, Peter Gazanian, and I can't go into all of that. Believe me, it bore my audience, so we don't have time. But if you're really fascinated, I'll tell you all about it afterwards. We measured uh, using a ratio method after we found out through trig that we could get away with this. That D reproducer is 1.875 inches in length, and this is actually a picture of this machine right here that we took at the same angle as the 1900 picture. And uh, we were able to calculate a length of 9.66 here. And the actual length is 9.75. We were less than 1%, uh, had less than 1% error. We went ahead and analyzed the 1900 picture of the original machine. And here you see it. There it is. Uh, 1.875 inches across each of those reproducers told us something very interesting. Between each stylus, three inches, not four and a half, three inches. And a cylinder length here of over nine inches. Each of the tracks, there are three tracks on this picture, each one begins three inches apart from the next. Therefore, whatever this is, it's not 14 inches long, it's very close to what we have here. And next, we did a little quick math just to determine from this 1904 picture, if you go four and a half inches between each stylus on this 1904 picture, you indeed get a 14 inch cylinder here. So we knew this is indeed a 1904 machine, 14 inches in length. Next. Now just for fun, you have one other there, Michael, with the overlaps. Maybe you don't have the overlaps. Okay, all right, anyway, we were gonna show you how we took one picture from the 1900 machine here, and a picture of Charlie's machine superimposed and got an exact match. And that was kinda neat. Now, some interesting facts we can now surmise. Um, I've pretty much exactly proved to myself that what we have here is the recording machine from the Columbia Graphophone Company for the 1900 era multiplex machine. So either that machine there, and it's the same one you see in that ad, is this machine, uh, or it's this machine. The other thing we can say is, even though in this, it, it, it talks about a cylinder that's longer, that may have been in the works, but that's not what you see pictured here. It's probably not what the Sultan got. The 14 inch may have been what the Shah got. But uh, you know what, I don't know. Um, all right, there's a few little interesting things the phonoscope says, uh, and I could give you those. I think we're getting out of time. Um, and uh, so if you'd like to learn some interesting facts about the cylinder, a lot of things, how long would this thing last, if you played a triple stereo track or not, uh, we will get to that if you want to talk to me afterwards, but I want to be careful of time. Um, this again are the exhibits. One of the things this thing says, which is really funny, uh, in 1904 it claims that this cylinder, if you had a single track, would play for 20 minutes. Now it's true if you play, if you have the thing rotating at 70 RPM, um, but that didn't happen. So I, I can assure you, I've talked to George Paul about this in detail. I can assure you we have a little license going on here. Uh, unless it was uh, 200 threads per inch like an amber roll, and I don't think so. Uh, what do we have next, my friend? Oh, that thing. Uh, now here's another thing. You may have wondered what that other cylinder was in that can. We're putting it together now. This is an actual two-track multiplex. One track here, another track here. It is standard concert size. Large parts of it do not exist, but we're in process of getting this so we can sample both tracks and verify that this is indeed a true double multiplex on a concert machine. And yes, we will be able to play it because this is one of McDonald's prototypes with two heads, and there we go. So uh, that's coming up. Also, uh, we're starting to toy with the fact that we better get a triple carriage on this machine. So we're starting to think that it would be awfully nice to do that. So one of these days, you folks can all hear what a multiplex triple track really sounded like. So that may be coming up next. And now, for the moment you've all been waiting for, I'm going to sit down. No, that's not it. Um, <laughs> I'm just guessing, maybe you folks would like to see what this thing looks like. Two sizes. Regular and ethyl. Well, um, this is the 10-inch uh, size, 9 and 3 quarter can. Each one is marked with a number so that you can tell me how much you have. Microphone. 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 Microph
pull that while you're Would you do that for me? I appreciate it. Human mic stand. Human mic stand, yes. What I was going to say is, in case you were interested, you might want to see what this thing looks like, and you might want to hear a little bit from it. If you don't, you can leave or put your finger to your ears. The first time I've ever heard of one in 110 years, the Columbia Multiplex Grand. And this is it, 144 RPM. And I would play you the entire contents, but you will find that it would bore you. Nevertheless, let's see what we got, Michael. restoration to do and we're fixing to get complete digital <laughs> we're fixing to get complete digital uh, restoration on this thing um, that was nice of Michael he threw that slide in there um, I want to thank my family for putting up with this malarkey for a year uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'll leave it right there Michael Sherman my wonderful audiovisual uh, uh, presenter and friend, great guy, uh, Peter Gazanian for trigonometric and mathematical calculations, uh, my son for his wonderful setup and playback assistance, Glenn Hummel, Charlie's son for photography and a lot of measurements, Mark Yolano for sound recording and photography, Scott and Denise Corbett for a lot of emotional support, parts manufacture, Tim Fabrizio, George Paul, Julian Anton, the U.S. Patent Office, I think, uh, Marie Morales, my office manager, Dr. Richard Dick Major, longtime friend and poli sci prof, uh, Sharam Hashimi, a wonderful uh, scholar in translating Persian documents for me, uh, Kathy Siraji, my hygienist and who grew up in the Persian culture and had a lot of insight for me, and of course Alan Konigsberg, the owner of the famous 14-inch Columbia carriage, and uh, who gave me a lot of photos and help, and Howard Hazelcorn for photos and information. I want to thank all of them, and I want to thank all of you for enduring this presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. I've uh, got time for a little bit of q and I'm told. So if you would like to throw out Q&A, we'll do it until David says we can't. Questions? I answered them all. Yes, Tom? Yeah, the two tracks. No, this is a one-track recording all the way. If I played the whole thing for you, you'd get three or four verses of the old oaken bucket. It's, yeah, and I was not going to put you through that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. That is, in fact, one announcement and four, five, almost six minutes. Six minutes, six minutes of recording. That's your question. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Um, Mike, the, uh, the, the two track machine? Yes. That, does that exist? That exists. That's an actual picture. It came from the American Graphophone Archives. My friend Charlie knows exactly where it is. Uh, that's again a McDonald prototype from about 1899. Any other questions? Now, there are piles of prototypes that were made. We're learning a lot right now. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, so, so is his father, too. That's correct. Flat disc. 
And uh, I did have that voice. I do have his voice, but I don't have time to play it. Yeah, it's fascinating. Something like that. Armenians and Persians, we can do that. Anybody else? Otherwise, talk to us afterwards, and we're going to... Yes? Do you have any idea when this was actually When it was recorded? We absolutely know when it was recorded. Late 1899 to mid-1900. The, the, the wax formula pretty much gives it away. So, anybody else? You can talk to us afterwards. We'd love doing it. And on with the show. Good work. Thanks a lot. Yeah.